Hello, presto. This is the BioSets Core Special Topics Talk number 18, Resampling a Magic. I'm Mark Williamson for the Dakota Project at the University of North Dakota. So let's get into our introduction here. The goal of this talk is to spell out the benefits and methods of resampling. To do so, we'll answer the questions, what is resampling? What are the major types of resampling? What can resampling be used for? And how does resampling work, along with some helpful worked examples in R? With the introduction out of the way, let's muddle our way through this talk. But actually, before we get into the meat of it, let's have a quick interlude. The genesis of this talk came from one of the best videos on statistics I've ever Listen to, it was a flash talk called Solve Every Statistics Problem with One Weird Trick, and it went over resampling. It blazed through the topics of resampling and visualization, Monte Carlo, confidence intervals, significance testing, error detection, and beyond. So the point of this talk was to expand on that very interesting talk, and go more into details of actually doing sam resampling for yourself. So if you haven't seen this video before, I suggest you take a look at it yourself. The YouTube link is in, will be in the references as well as in the description below. With that out of the way, let's get started. On the what. So how do we define resampling? Well, Wikipedia has a short and not particularly helpful definition of creation of new samples based on one observed sample. Not bad, but not exactly what we're looking for when it comes to statistics. So, Indeed has a little bit more detailed explanation, calling it a series of techniques using statistics. Uh, there we go here. To gather more information about a sample, this can include retaking a sample or estimating its accuracy. So that's really digs more into what we're looking for here. These are resamplings as a series of statistical techniques to for certain outcomes, especially ac retaking a sample or a strain accuracy. So what that looks like, next, turn to the question of the types of resampling because different types will be used for different outputs of resampling. So I, I kind of put together three major types piecing together from the references four through seven here. There's, there didn't seem to be a canonical sort of taxonomy, so this is the best I could come with, come up with here. Maybe people would define things differently or lump things in different ways, but this is, I thought, a good working set of types. So the three major types is permutation, cross-validation, and normal resampling. So permutation over on the left side here, it's also known as re-randomization. It resamples original data, assuming the null hypothesis. This is, importantly, sampling without replacement. So the data set, so the number of observations in a permutation test for the permutations is the same as the original data. In the middle here, we have cross-validation. It's a way to validate a predictive model. So something like regression, decision trees, other sorts of trees. And these will include a jackknife, K-fold, and Monte Carlo, which we'll see in a moment. And then normal resampling, which is resampling with replacement. So that makes it different from permutation, where the resample, the resamples may be smaller or different setup, maybe duplications than the original data. And so kind of going a level up here in within permutation, there is essentially randomization. This is the simplest probably form of resampling, such as shuffling observations across groups. So you can imagine data where there's groups like A and B and then some sort of measurement. And so you shuffle around the, which groups the measurement is in, and you can do this repeatedly to calculate statistics, some sort of stats like mean or something like that. Now with cross-validation, I've already kind of mentioned this. There's two big types. Monte Carlo and K-fold validation. Monte Carlo is used in simulation where the parent distribution is known or assumed, and methods use repeated sampling from populations with well-known characteristics to determine how sensitive statistical procedures are to those characteristics. 
k fold validation. In this, you actually split your data set into k groups. So the k is some sort of number. Five is a pretty typical one, or 10. And you go through leaving out each group and see how robust the estimator it is. So this is often set up as a, a test versus training data scenario. Monte Carlo is often the, that too, but Monte Carlo is used very broadly in more advanced in a lot of advanced procedures. And it, and going into the real details of that is going to be kind of beyond the scope of this test because Monte Carlo could be its own thing here. So we'll we'll focus when we go into the nitty gritty more on K-fold validation. Now a specific kind of K-fold validation is the jackknife. It sequentially deletes one observation, then recomputing. So it's the singular case of k-fold validation. Whereas in k-fold, five-fold validation, it might be split into five groups. Jackknifing, it's split into the number of groups of observations. So if you have a data set with 20 rows, so it's 20 observations, there'll be 20 jackknife recomputations. And you can estimate a parameter and place confidence limits on it with a jackknife and also k-fold validation. Finally, under normal resampling, the main thing here is the bootstrap. It estimates sample distribution and methods use sampling with replacement to establish confidence intervals, among other things. Now, a, a, a good comparison between, say, bootstrap and jackknife. Now, jackknife is, is fairly small and handy and, and fairly conceptually simple, where bootstrap can be a much bigger workshop full of tools to use on prediction or confidence, etc. Okay, I kind of went a little bit over the types here. Now let's switch to uses. Under the uses, there's a variety of uses you can use, but these are some, probably some of the biggest ones. You can do null hypothesis significant testing, specifically through permutation. That's a good use of that. Accuracy or confidence intervals of some sort of metric, some sort of statistics. So bootstrap's really good for that. Also a sampling distribution of a test statistic. Bootstrap is a particularly good example of that. Finally, a, a big thing that resampling can be used for is validating predictive models, especially with things like capable validation, Jack of Monte Carlo, that's where they really shine. Uh, Monte Carlo specifically, some, some things that you see it being used for in resampling a lot is estimating density or approximating a quantity or optimize a, optimizing a function. Now, these aren't all the uses, but these are some good pic big picture concepts of using it. Okay, now let's turn to a bit on the how, how these things work here. So, first of all, this is mostly, resample is mostly done on a computer, though a lot of these things you could theoretically do by hand other than Monte Carlo. Now, you can do this in all sorts of programs. There's R, SAS, Python, etc. For the worked out examples I'll show later, I'll be using R, though you can certainly do in whatever flavor of statistical tools you use. Now, to, to do this, you'll, you'll need a data set, obviously your data to work on, and then objective, what, what your outcome you want to be, the, 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 the uses that you want to get out of this. Now, but, uh, and I'll go through kind of each of these in turn here with a pictorial representation. So, so to get into the how of permutation is you, you, you're gonna have data that are in groups like say A, B, and C. And so you're gonna change groups around and then recalculate whatever statistics. Maybe you're gonna do the mean, uh, difference in mean between groups, some, some like a t-test, or maybe you're doing ANOVA, et cetera. You're gonna change the groups around, that's the permute, permuting. And now for a simple small data set, with, let's say three observations, A, B, and C, you could theoretically, you could do all every permutation and, and compare everything. Now for larger data sets, that becomes prohibitively uh, computationally infeasible to do every sort of permutation. So you often do a subset, you maybe do 100, 1,000, 10,000, but maybe not every permutation if your data set is large enough. And then you can, all those permutations and recalculation statistics sort of sets up the null hypothesis. Like if there was no difference between the groups and it was sort of randomly that would be what you'd expect there. And so you can see how your actual groups, maybe that's test statistics you computed for that, how it fares in the, the, the forest, the po all possible or, or a subset of all possible permutations, see if it is really that different. 
Turning now to the bootstrap. So here's a couple different visualizations. So what happens with the bootstrap is you have a sample from a population. So either shown here with a histogram or just a more pictorial bird's eye view. And this population is at a sample size N. And in bootstrapping, you draw a sample from the original sample with replacement. That is, a, a point on in the sample could be sampled within the bootstrap sample more than once. And since these bootstrap samples are smaller than the original sample, they're going to have less. Anyways, you're going to sample with replacement and replicate a certain number of times, D times. Each resampled is called a bootstrap sample. So examples here, we can see histograms of the resampling here is just a bird's eye view. And then you can evaluate some sort of statistic. So in your original sample, you're going to do some sort of sample statistic, maybe a mean, maybe some sort of correlation, whatever. But then for the bootstrap samples, you can sample that statistic as well for each of these subsamples or resamples. And there'll be a total of however many bootstraps resampling. So then B, that could be 50, it could be 100, it could be 10,000. You estimate that statistic, so again shown here, and then you can generate from there a sampling distribution of those statistics to use it for further statistical inferences. Now with cross-validation, let's start by talking about just the more general K-full validation. You have your data sets. And you're going to shuffle the data set randomly and split the data set into k groups again that's where that k comes into so uh, example here is a sort of default five you're going to have one group that you're going to hold out as the test data or also known as the validation data and then the rest is training and you're going to fit a model so this is usually again we are evaluating how good a model is on the training data set and get the performance out fit the model, evaluate, and then evaluate on the, the test set. And you'll retain the evaluation score and discard the model. And you'll do this for each group. So this first one here, this was the, the test data, then this one, then this one, this one, and then you can figure out how well it performed. And this will summarize the skill of the model using the sample of the model evaluation scores. Now, Again, we talked about jackknife being sort of the limit case of this. So in the jackknife, say you have a sample size of 10, you're gonna have tenfold because each time you're gonna leave one out. So this is something that's known as leave one out resampling. You leave one out and calculate whatever you're doing here, whatever statistic, and then you can evaluate how successful that was. It might be a simple, simple, simple statistic. It might be a full model just like in k-fold and again k-fold can be used for just a simple statistics but it's more commonly used for how well a, a total model does like a linear regression model but in either case that is how cross-validation works for the jackknife and just the more general k-fold finally with monte carlo i'm again not really going to go into details this is often a type of graph that's pulled out from some sort of analysis but really what's happening in monte carlo is you're going to define a domain of possible inputs generate inputs randomly from a probability distribution over the domain perform deterministic computation on the inputs and then aggregate the results okay so we talked about so the theory, the de explanation, description, et cetera. Now let's go into some examples. So the example I'm going to use is a data set of Magic the Gathering playing card data found from this resource here. It's really great. You can actually get all sorts of data from pretty much every playing card. So I'm just going to use cards from the 10th edition. And so here's just a head of, of the variables I included. So I have a name just to kind of have some flavor here. The colors, because Magic Colors comes in five col colors. Uh, the set code, again, I was doing 10th edition. And then here are some variables. There are three numerical variables, mana, cost, power, and toughness, and then a categorical variable. And 
it's important to note that only types of that are the creatures will have power and toughness while everything will have a mana cost so so a lot of my analyses will just be on creatures though i'll be a few times where i use another type and just a heads up on this data set i removed any because i'm also interested in colors i guess this is a another categorical categorical variable i did remove all cards that were colorless just to restrict analysis just to cards with colors so then let's jump right into our first question we're going to start with a permutation test ask the question is average power different between green and white creatures the power being here this number here how much damage it does we're going to ask is there a difference between green creatures and white creatures Before I get into the first question, just make sure all the packages are loaded correctly. Boop. Here's the magic card. And again, there should be a link to the data set I'm using in the description of this video. But here's just the ahead of the data. We can see here we have index, name, color, set code, converted mana cost, etc. You can run all sorts of plots if you really want, but for the most part, I'm interested right now in creating this sub data set called creatures, but it's just the creatures. You could look at all sorts of average statistics and box plots, histograms, etc. So you can play with them if you want. However, for my purposes, I'm going to jump right into that first question average power difference between green and white creatures and to do so i'm going to again subset to just green and white creatures so you can see there's going to be white and green all the way down first of all i'm going to start out and run just a generalized linear model because this data given these sorts of histograms i don't think they're normally distributed so something like a poisson distribution because it's more like kind of count variables would probably be the best analysis so i'm just going to run that this is essentially like a t-test but in general as linear format where it looks like yes colors is significant looks like white significantly lower so <clears throat> that gives me enough confidence to just run a general or a regular linear model and use that throughout just to simplify things of comparison that and some of these resampling methods so we're going to run that Again, we're just going to find that, yeah, the linear model, it's still significant. And if I just run a quick plot, just to visualize that, yeah, we see on average, green creatures have a power of a little over 2.5, where whites are less than 1.5. So fairly big difference. Now, this is the step where we're going to run the resampling by using LMP. And it's a probability resampling. When we do that, we run, we find this is significant as well. And so we can trust that, yeah, our, through a permutation test, we found that this difference between green creatures and white creatures in power was significantly different compared to the null hypothesis, because that's what you do in permutation testing, the null hypothesis that they were the same. So there we go. Continuing on, another question on the permutation test is average toughness difference between green and black creatures. Toughness being also, AKA defense, being this number here on the card. Next question is average toughest difference between black and white, black and green creatures subsetting to just black and green. So black, green, again, running just a GLM to see if that's significant with sort of the best test. Okay, that's on the, on the cusp, but I think I can trust just a regular linear model. And again, that's, yep, still significant under 0 0.05 to show that. We can see here that 
yeah, green creatures are on average tougher, about three, three compared to about two. And I'll again run this permutation test against the null impostors that there is no difference. And that comes out again, just under the line of significant. So there we go. Through permutation testing, we were pretty confident that that average toughness being different was a true outcome against the null. Final thing under permutation tests, we want to look at a example for visualization purposes. To visualize, I'm going to start by just putting the difference between green and white creature power into a coefficient, t coefficient, if we just want to write that out. We see that, yeah, it's, it's about negative 0.85, so almost a one point difference. And then to do this here, I'm going to create a for loop to essentially per, per, permutate these, these data sets by hand, or not by hand, but by code to look at it each time. And so as I said the seed, so it should be reproducible when you run it, if you set the same seed. So I'm gonna have an empty coefficient list and then over a thousand samples, I'm going to essentially permutate the, the order of whether a creature is green or white, keep their power the same so that the, the data set, the, the power will be the same. It won't shift, but the because the group shift, there'll be a different group with a different power for each of these permutations. Then I'm going to create a new data frame with these two, run this a linear model, pull out that coefficient, so that difference between green and white creature power, and then add that to the list. So that at the end of this, I'll create a new data frame. And what that will do here is it will give me a say length coef data frame. It'll give me a data set <clears throat> with a thousand permutations. And what I'm going to do is plot that as a histogram. And you can see that this is the, under a null hypothesis, this is what we would expect the coefficient. So it's centered around zero, unsurprisingly, all the way up to above one or quite a bit less than one. And then I'm going to actually the actual coefficient we got from our, our test was negative 0.85. And then I'm going to get essentially the number that you would expect out of a thousand to sort of by chance be that extreme or greater. And that's going to be four. And then I'm just going to add our actual coefficient to that test. We can see here it's way down on the tail here. And, and sort of by definition, four out of a thousand would be a p-value of 0 0.0004. So we are highly confident that the estimated value we got between green and white creatures through this permutation test are indeed significantly different. Next set of examples will be with bootstrapping. We wanna start by asking the question, what is the bootstrap confidence in mean cost for instance? Now instance, they're a type of card they can play at any time. So they're, they're typically, you can think of them as spells that can be played at any time. And they'll of course have some sort of mana cost. So we wanna see how, how commerce we are in the mean cost overall of the 10th edition for instance. With bootstrapping, I'm going to take a look at the creatures that are, or not creatures, the cards that are instance. So we see here, again, it's there's no power and toughness, so just convert mana cost, color, and type. I'm going to create a sub, sub data set, which is just the cost of instance, and the mean of that is 0.25. So I want to look at the bootstrap confidence intervals around that. So again, set the seed, run this function. Uh, th this, uh, this function called boot, it needs a function that's calculating whatever statistics. So I'm going to call it mean function, which is just take the mean of this. And I'm going to try it for 50 replications. Oh, sorry, I have to run this first. 
Okay, so 50 replications, that's gonna be reps one. So that's kind of the low end, any lower than I don't think it'll actually even work. And then at the high end, like 10,000. Here we go, and so let's plot the distribution. You can see here with not a lot of samples, it's a little bit sparse. You know, it says, yeah, what we calculated is like 0 0.2, 0.5, and it, it ranges from below two to above three. And if we look at the one with a lot more bootstrap replications, we see uh, a nice, much cleaner, sort of normal curve. Again, below two, above three, but centered around 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And we can actually calculate confidence intervals rather than just looking at a graph. Let's see here for the, the low bootstrapping, it's between about two and three. 95% confidence that that mean we calculated was is the true mean or the mean that yeah falls within the true mean of that the data and if we do the higher rep one we see that, that this has tightened up a little bit it is now rather than 2.07 2.11 and then this one has dropped from a little bit above three to a little bit below three so the more resampling is, the, the more accurate we have an estimation. Another question we want to ask is how common can we be in not just a simple test statistic of one type of variable, but a correlation between two types, two variables, mana cost and creature power. So again, mana cost and then how powerful a creature is. This is across all five colors. To get the correlation between a mana cost and creature power, I'm going to create another subset, which is just going to be creature power and converted mana cost. Just make things simpler. You can see here power and cost. So we're going to do a correlation. And since this is not really normally distributed, we're going to do the non-parametric version, the Spearman, get a correlation. And we see that, oh, it's a pretty high correlation, 0.72. So pretty highly correlated, so that's nice. And just to show what that looks like, we're gonna plot that. And see here, yeah, uh, again, it's not no normally distributed because this is count data, but you can see there seems to be a pretty strong trend, positive trend. As power increases, cost increases. So again, I'm gonna use that boot function, but so I'm gonna need to do an, a new correlation function because we're not doing mean anymore. We need to do this correlation setup to run the bootstrap, resample it, and I'm just gonna do one this time, the, the 10,000, yep, reps three. And again, this isn't showing us uh, an estimate of the mean, it's the estimate of the correlation. And so we hear, again, it's it's about seven, set around 0.72, but it can range from below six to above 0.8. And again, we can do conference intervals. And it looks like, yeah, we have 95% confidence that's between 6.2 and 8.0. And if we even want to, we can do a density plot to kind of more clearly show that. Again, this is the kind of where we found the, our estimate, and then this is the density of, of probability around, around that. Again, it goes from around 6 to a little more than 8. Now, let's turn to K-fold validation, and I want to start to answer how accurate a model is. So I want to see if power and toughness can predict mana cost for creatures, which you'd think it would. Stronger and tougher creatures would tend to cost more. You, you think that would be sort of the, the relationship between the two. So we'll ask how accurate our model is using the standard K-fold validation. Looking at k validation, I'm going to run a linear model, which is going to be converted mana cost as a function of power and toughness, and then the star means and also the interaction. So we're going to have three variables here, and then data set creatures. If we look at the summary here, okay, so we see power is significant. Looks like that's positive as power goes up, cost goes up. So Toughness is also significant, again, as it goes up. Now, the interaction between power and toughness is a little hard to parse out, but that is significant, though it is in the negative direction, so some sort of interplay setup 
I'm not going to go into the exact interpretation. It's just important to know that all three variables are significant in our model. So now to do some validation, I'm going to create a control, which is going to use this train control method CV number five, so five-fold validation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because a lot of times this, when you're trying to validate a model, see how predictive it is, you're actually looking at a bunch of different models and see which one does the best. So I'm actually going to create four models. The first model is the simplest, which just has power. And the next one has just toughness, then power and toughness, and then our full model that we kind of showed up here. Again, we're using this, we're, we're using this, this function train that's going to use the setup so that part of them is going to be set aside as a the test data, and then the rest will be the training data. So I'm going to run these four models. And now the, what these models are going to spit out are a variety of things. The, the most the three most important are their RSME, the root mean squared error. That's a measure of essentially how good the model did. So the lower the battle, better. The R squared, which is essentially the correlation, the higher the better. And then the MAE, the mean absolute error, again, the lower the battle, better. So I'm just going to pull the print all these results at the same time. You can see a lot going on. But really what we see here, the model four, so that's the, the most complex model, the power, toughness, and the interaction, actually ends up having the lowest RSME, the highest R squared, and the lowest MAE. So that's kind of the best fit model based on our K-fold validation. So I'm just going to put out the, yeah, the, the full model. And we can see here that the estimated power, toughness, and interaction, those, those estimates are very close to what we, what we calculated when we just ran the, our linear model here, 0 0.72, 0 0.63, negative 0 0.06. Continuing in on K-fold validation, let's talk more about the same question we had earlier, but now let's try with just jackknife validation. See how that might differ a little bit. Now to do jackknife, we can use this PCR function. I'm going to use the full data set here. Validation. We're going to do LLO, that means leave one out. So that means it's going to be the, essentially the jackknife. So we need to set jackknife as true. Let's save this as a object, JLM. I'm going to run jack test on that. And it gives us, yeah, the power toughness and power toughness were all significant running those jackknife analyses. And again, they're very, the, the estimates are going to be about the same and the T values look pretty, pretty close to, they're still quite significant. So that gives us confidence that our, our model is fairly accurate. And lastly, under capable validation, I want to do another visualization, kind of looking at what it looked like for the jackknife, that leave one out analysis. To visualize, let me look at the coefficients again for that full model. Power, again, 7 point, about 7.2, toughness 6.3, power and toughness negative 0 0.06. So what we're going to do here is, first of all, we're going to just add power and toughness as just the coefficients by themselves, because we'll use later in graphing. And like we did for the other visualization, I'm going to essentially do a for loop. So I want to set LC as the length of our data set, the, the, the creature's data set have an empty coefficient list for power and toughness. And then for every, so essentially for the length of that data set, because this is gonna be the jackknife, we're gonna look at each of them, leaving one out. I'm gonna go from one to essentially the length of the data set, create a new data frame where I'm gonna pop, remove one, one of the rows. And so for the first run, for the first iteration, it'll take out the first row, that's I starting at one, then the second row I two, all the way to I of length, the full length of the data set. So 
will go through all the column or all the rows, leaving one of the rows out each time. So I'm gonna call this linear model, leave one out. It's gonna be a linear model of that new data frame with the one row missing. I'm going to name set power and toughness, those coefficients from those models as objects and then add them to those empty lists. So at the end of it, and then I'm gonna make new data frames. So at the end of it, what we're gonna have here is two data frames with new coefficients run from every single one of those analyses. So I'm just gonna say length, power, let's see, coefficient, no, power jack data frame. Jack data frame, and that is gonna be coefficient. You see that's 172. I just wanna length creatures. Let's see, then that was, the same length as our creature data set. Okay, I'm going to plot. This is going to be the power. Okay, and so what we see here is the black line is our coefficient for power in our, just our full model. And then the red bars are the histogram of the distribution of those coefficients through the jackknife sampling. You can see it clusters around that, you know, so there are a few extreme cases, but most fall pretty closely. And again, we can do the same sort of thing here with toughness. Again, mostly centered around this coefficient we calculated with the full model and then the distribution of coefficients of, of each of those jackknife resamples. With that, here are the references that I mentioned throughout the talk. They also should be found in the description of the video below here. So this is the first one. Second set of references, all the way to 17. And then finally, there is references for the R code. Now there should also be a link to the R code used in the description below. And then these are the references I used to put together that R, the code for the R code that it's also in the R code itself, but if you just wanted them separately, here they are. Well then, some acknowledges before I close, the Dakota is supported by the NIH, so please acknowledge the Dakota if you found this research helpful. With that, thanks for joining me. Now go, go resample until you can sample no more and the magic fades.